Welcome everyone. Like I just said, <laughs> to those of you who are here in the room, my name is Jacqueline Sundberg. I am one of a great team here at Roar, one of the professionally curious as it were. And I work with the Roar Group here at the library, which stands for Rare Books Special Collections, the Ozer Library of the History of Medicine, the Visual Arts Collection, Archives and Record Management. If this is your first time tuning into a Roar event or coming to a Roar event, welcome. If not, welcome back. For those of you who are here in the room, hearty welcome. It's nice to see you in person. For those of you who are joining us remotely, thank you for tuning in. Thanks for joining us. Curiosity and an appetite for maybe with a little side of small discovery probably brought uh, quite a few of you here. Our special guest and new colleague, Kristen Howard, will be magnifying a very particularly special collection today, the Roy Scale Miniature Book Collection. So for those of you who are joining virtually, just a few notes. So today is a hybrid event. So there is virtual attendees and in-person attendees. And we will op be offering this hybrid format for most of our events going forward. So stay tuned for news and events. And we hope to see some of you in person in the not too distant future. That said, our next event is a drop-in exhibition on May 31st, and we will have some of the tiny books talked about today on display. One other note about this virtual event is that we did go through the process of planning this in a sustainable way, and we did get certified for that, and we're proud to share it, to put in the extra effort of planning things in a sustainable way. So the last note from me is actually about location. It's a delight to welcome some of you in person to this space, which is the McGill Library in the Red Path and McLennan Complex. And this is located on land that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations. Roar and the library and McGill honors, recognizes, and respects the nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which we're meeting today. So I'm gonna give a sneak peek of what's happening. I'm gonna introduce Natalie Cook shortly. And after that, Christopher Lyons will take over for some collection comments. And our main presentation is from Kristen Howard and we'll have a bit of a Q&A at the end. So if you're tuning in remotely, do send your questions by email or in the chat for that and we will present them. So now I'm gonna leave the screen up, but Natalie, you can come up. Natalie, in addition to being a professor of English here at McGill, is the Associate Dean of Roar for, and has been for about, how long? Five years. And under her leadership, we've offered a really engaging and diverse range of programs, but I'll let her take the microphone. Perfect. Thanks so much, Jacqueline. Um, and hello, everybody. It's uh, fun to be speaking to people both here live and in virtual space. I want to start just with a few thank yous to those who've made these events possible, to Jacqueline, who actually performs wizardry. And this, this may look intuitive, but hybrid events are not that intuitive. We're actually learning all the time in terms of how to do this. And thanks also to Labiba Faiza, who is in another room. So those of you live can't see her, but she's making the wizardry happen behind the scenes with the live stream. Um, because of the support of donors, we can offer these events freely to everyone. And today we're celebrating one donor in particular, Roy Scale, an enthusiastic and discerning collector whose collection of miniature books was given to McGill we are delighted to celebrate this gift by taking a close look at some of the books themselves. Now, today we have a couple of milestones to celebrate and you can, you can feel me sort of smiling here. The first is that we're back in person. So we have some folks from Ontario in the room and they've been back in person for a while, but in Quebec, this is our first in-person event here at McGill. And so it's really incredibly exciting for us to be here in the research commons. Our usual space upstairs is actually currently the staging grounds for a major collection move for the Oster Library of the History of Medicine. And that's why we're displaced and we're downstairs and not in our rare book space upstairs. There are more space changes to come since we look forward to new spaces for future events with our building redesign project Fiat Lux. Now there's somebody here live today who said the last time he was in the building was 50 years ago. 
and we laughed to one another. And I said, I bet it hasn't changed that much. And he laughed and said, no, it hasn't, but it will. And so Fiat Lux illumination is the spirit of this project, which will totally transform our current building in the coming years. This is an exciting moment for the library when we get to reimagine our library spaces so as to better preserve and animate our collections. And in fact, the, the architects were here today from Boston coming up to think about this redesign. Your support is needed. Find out more about the project on our website. The second milestone is that we're in, introducing a new library colleague to you today, Kristen Howard. Now you'll hear more about this from Chris, who's going to introduce her, but let me just let you in on a secret. Kristen has been working with me on a research project for a couple of years now, and she's absolutely an extraordinary um, academic and scholar, and we are so happy that the library was clever enough to nab her before somebody else gave her a job. She also brings recent experience working with the Lily Toth miniature book collection at the Jewish Public Library. And so we're going to benefit today from Kristen's research and work on that collection. And as you'll hear, there are some big insights arising from comparisons between the two collections of miniatures. I had to get some comment about big and small in here. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to hear more. Now, to return a, just a moment to the Osler Library move, it's no small project to move an entire library collection both the rare books and the circulating collection itself. We're, we're really heartened and happy to see the Oster Library moving back up the, the hill to its home in the McIntyre building. And those of you who came in person today probably even noticed some of the moving trucks outside that are ready to whisk things up the hill. Now, of course, if William Oster had shared Roy Scales curatorial taste, moving that collection would be much more simple. <laughs> Roy Scale collected miniatures with the majority of the volumes in his collection at less than three inches high. Storage space is not a problem. One of the custom bookcases in his collection contains nearly a hundred volumes and fits into a space that's only two feet square. And we'll be showing you some slides of, of this wonderful little bookcase. What marvels these miniature volumes are. I expect CBC will coming to be coming to hound us very soon for their series, The Best in Miniature. Now, let me introduce Chris Lyons, Head of Rare Books and Special Collections. Chris himself will soon be stepping into a new role and actually into my role, in fact. He'll be taking over as interim associate dean of ROAR in September this year, and I'll be going on sabbatical leave. And I'm sure once you've heard him and those of you who know him will agree that I'm leaving you and ROAR in good hands. Chris, over to you. Thank you. It's uh, daunting and a real delight to be here in person. As we said, this is the first time in at least two years we've done this and what a way to start. So I'm here essentially to celebrate the memory of Mr. Roy Scale and his magnificent collection of over 1000 uh, miniature books. But we're also here to celebrate the generosity of his family who are here to celebrate the fact that they made this donation and I'd like to mention them by name. There's Stephen Philip Gale, Robert Royce Gale, Susan Gale Hall, Christopher Gale, wonderful first name, Donald McIntosh, David Gale, and Stephen Turner Gale. So thank you for your profound generosity. I also have to acknowledge the important work done by Donna Jean-Louis and her husband, Adrian King Edward, from the Word Bookstore because it was Donna in particular who was asked to appraise the collection and who I think immediately fell in love, saw the tremendous, tremendous work that Royce did over a lifetime and said, this is, this is no ordinary collection of books. This is a special 
collection and it really needs to be kept intact and it really needs to go somewhere so other people can enjoy this. This is the legacy of Royce and his knowledge and his passion. And thankfully his family, so blessed, felt the same way. And this is why we're here today to celebrate it. Uh, his niece, Susan Gale Hall, was very kind to give me some notes on Roy, because I never met him. I know people who have and have spoken so highly of him and the memories you have of him are just wonderful. So he was born in 1927 and raised in Waterville, Quebec in the Eastern Township. And his love of books started in childhood, but well at McGill, he bought his first book. Whoops, there he is, yes. Um, it was doing his BA in 1948. And in 1949, he graduated with a teaching diploma from Bishops. So the book bug bit him and it bit hard because I think of all the collections I've seen, the knowledge that he put into it, the care in collecting the right things in the perfect condition is just second to none. This is really an exceptional connoisseur. So he was married to Janet McIntosh from 1952 until her death in 2019. That's 67 years together. And Janet was an accomplished artist and teacher of early American decorative arts. And I just imagine what a joy it must have been to visit them with these great, great interests and complementary interests. And I gather a very loving relationship. They had no children of their own, but Royce once remarked that he thought of his books as his children. So I am glad we have given his children a new home. In 2017, when the time came to move into a long care facility, Royce was happy to have his miniature book collection with him and only 70 of his 4,000 regular or normal size books. Now, I love this story because apparently he was told he could take a few books. So he brought his 70 book. I, I don't know how you do that. It's like a Sophie's choice, which 70 do you choose? But he snuck in, I think Adrian, you were the one who told me like in his closet, it was like, you know, his secret stash because they're tiny. So he could do that and assigned E.M. Forrester amongst his, in the closet amongst his, I would hide that. Yeah, you and you, I can see why he did that, but just this wonderful collection that he secreted away. And the, um, and his collection, the donation uh, to the McGill Book Fair of a number of his books um, that we didn't have, not his miniature books. Again, that money went to scholarship. So again, just the generosity, which I see is a pattern in your family. So thank you for that. Um, your family, you have described him as a jovial storyteller who loved to show off his miniature books with a dramatic flourish. He would start with the larger of his smaller books and work his way down to the smallest, introducing little surprises and, odd and oddities along the way. Now, bit of vocabulary. Uh, this was a gift from Susan and it was given to her by Royce. And we figured, she figured she gave it to him because it's not a miniature book. But I asked with Chris, Kristen, and she said, if it was a little bit smaller, it'd be a maxi mini, macro mini, but it's not, it's a, it's a maxi macro mini. <laughs> and so, but we're, we're, we're thankful for it anyway. And it's a beautiful book, notwithstanding. After Royce's death in the summer of 2000, his cherished miniature book collection was donated here to Rare Books and Special Collections. And Susan concludes that he would have been thrilled. Well, so are we. So thank you. Now, enough from me, if that's possible. Kristen Howard is a liaison librarian, newly minted, as you heard, for the History, Classics, and Indigenous Studies at McGill. She has a PhD in history, as you heard, and is a keen miniature book enthusiast. So keen enthusiast, not just an enthusiast, and a keen enthusiast, as you are about to discover. Kristen? Excellent. All right, thank you very much, Natalie and Chris. So um, I am uh, very excited to be here to talk to all of you about first miniature books in general, and then this collection in particular. So to give you a bit of an overview and a small teaser photo, first I'll talk to you about what miniature books are and why people collect miniatures. Although of course, some of you here in the room might be able to tell me more about why Royce collected miniatures in particular. I'll talk just a little bit about how miniatures are created, and then I'll move on to magnifying the Royce Gale collection. 
So to begin, miniature book is a genre that depends entirely on size rather than on content, which is more typical for our genre designations. The Miniature Book Society, which is the preeminent society of miniature book collectors, creators, and enthusiasts, has created what has become the binding definition of a miniature book. A book is considered miniature if it is bound and less than three inches in length and width. There are further categories of size, as Chris alluded to. A macro miniature is slightly larger, up to four inches. A micro miniature is less than one inch, and an ultra micro miniature is less than one quarter of an inch. And all of these sizes, except for macros, are represented in Royce's collection. Historically, books have been produced in miniature size for thousands of years, beginning with miniature cuneiform tablets in ancient Babylon. The history of miniature books matches that of book history more generally, with the creation of miniaturized scrolls, manuscripts, and eventually printed books. Other collections here in Canada include, as you've heard, the Lily Toth Miniature Book Collection at the Jewish Public Library, which I was fortunate to work closely with this year, which is especially rich in Hungarian miniatures. And there are also smaller collections at the University of Toronto, University of British Columbia, and the Toronto Public Library. Now, why do people collect miniatures? Something I'm often asked about miniatures is, but how do you read them? Miniature books are seldom collected to actually be read, at least nowadays. Their minuscule text and frequently delicate or stiff bindings make it challenging and sometimes undesirable to read many of them. I don't know about you, but I don't love having to use a magnifying glass for my pleasure reading. The allure of miniature books perhaps more often depends on other aspects, including their practicality, portability, curiosity, and aesthetic value. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of these aspects. So miniature books are practical, if not to be read, but because of the small amount of space that they take up. This can make them ideal for collectors living in small spaces, or perhaps who need to hide some of their books uh, in a closet. <laughs> They're also practical for the small size of children's hands, and many miniature book collectors first begin collecting when their children themselves, developing a lifelong affinity or interest in miniature books, as well as books more generally. Miniatures are also very portable, not when they're an entire collection, but one at a time. They can easily be stowed in a pocket or purse. This makes them excellent for travelers, and historically, they were frequently carried by traveling merchants or soldiers. A miniature that is a prized possession is easy to carry, and this can be especially important for religious books. Miniatures can also be used or referred to quite discreetly. Think of someone wanting to check on the translation of a word in a bilingual dictionary without kind of giving away the fact that they're checking, or perhaps a young woman in the Victorian era referring to an etiquette book while courting and making sure that she's giving the right kinds of signals. Miniatures also offer privacy. Because they can be easily concealed, the reader or owner of censored material can be protected from persecution. The Museum of Miniature Books in Azerbaijan, which is the only museum of this kind in the world, includes miniatures that were produced to covertly disseminate pro-democracy texts during the Soviet era. So you can see how the size can, and sometimes be as important as the content itself for particular owners or readers. Miniatures are by their very nature curious as something defined entirely by size. Many people find themselves particularly drawn to items that are much smaller or much larger than is typical. And I think that there's something really attractive about important texts being available in such small packages. There's something wondrous and even magical about being able to hold in your hands the words of a famous author or playwright like Shakespeare, or for a religious person to carry the word of God in your hands or perhaps close to your heart in a pocket. And finally, many miniature books, especially those in Royce Gale's collection, have a particular aesthetic value, especially those that are referred to as artist books or fine press books. Some of these are created entirely by hand and have unusual and exquisite shapes, bindings, illustrations, and more. Additionally, the miniature size presents challenges to all of the artisans involved in bookmaking, 
from typesetter to printer to illustrator to binder. And the challenge enhances the allure of miniatures for many collectors and creators. Today, miniature books are created both by hand as well as by machine. And these are a few pictures that were shared with me by Alexander Cave, who is a hobbyist bookbinder in Scotland, who has recently begun uh, binding books in miniature. And this gives you a bit of an idea of some of the steps just in the binding process. Creating and binding miniature books follows the same process as that of more regular size books, just with that added challenge of their tiny size. Before the onset of the printing press in Western Europe, which trailed behind the creation of movable type in the East by hundreds of years, miniatures were like other manuscripts created entirely by hand. The first miniature book printed in Western Europe appeared from the workshop of Johannes Gutenberg, the creator of the Gutenberg Bible. Uh, in 1468. So that's when we see the first printed miniature in Western Europe. Technological advancements in the 19th and early 20th centuries made it easier to print increasingly smaller books, and the growing popularity of miniatures made their production more profitable. Increasing popularity in the early 20th century is often attributed to the creation of a miniature library for the dollhouse of Queen Mary in 1922. She had books created at a scale of one to 12, one inch to one foot, meaning that they were about the size of a postage stamp. And all of the books, uh, it was very important to Queen Mary, had the exact words in them that they had at the regular size. So they were, they were true replicas. Many of Queen Mary's subjects were then inspired to create miniature books for their own dollhouses. And this led to a bit of a miniature book craze uh, in England as well as across the pond here in America or in North America uh, in the first quarter of the 20th century. Technological advancements included typecasting machines, which allowed type to be cut by machine rather than by hand, leading to the creation of smaller fonts. Most miniature books are created in size six font, although especially tiny books are sometimes printed in size two or two and a half. And although we are all viewing this on different screens, I think that we're all very familiar with what a size 12 font looks like printed. And so showing you size six and size two, even though it's a different depending on your screen, uh, kind of shows you just how tiny those fonts are. Further technological developments that aided the creation of miniature books included photographic reduction, which combined with lithographical printing allowed for the reduction of so-called mother books into miniaturized versions. And for the especially uh, tiny books, the ultra micro miniatures that are printed in the size two font, usually that type is cut not individual letters because they would be too hard to place, but rather the entire page is cut into one very tiny uh, piece of metal type. All right, so now with that background, I would like to move on to the collection that we're interested in here today, the Roy Scale Miniature Book Collection, which as you've heard was generously donated by the family of Eastern Township teacher and principal Roy Scale. This diverse collection of over 1000 miniature books is an especially notable collection of fine press books. And it includes a variety of genres ranging from alphabet books to religious books to poetry, history, and more. The Gale Collection also includes many handwritten, personally addressed notes and receipts from miniature book creators, attesting to how embedded Royce Gale was within the miniature book creating and collecting circles, not only developing important business ties with some of the world's leading miniature book publishers and creators, but also deep friendships. And he also has a number of keepsakes from Miniature Book Society Conclaves, which is the name for the kind of major annual conference of the Miniature Book Society. This ephemera will be especially valuable to uh, miniature book enthusiasts like me and scholars hoping to learn more about the insular world of miniature book collecting or to trace the history of miniature book collecting circles in the United States and Canada. So now I'm going to uh, highlight some of the books in the collection, and I'm going to begin with some of the older or more historic books um, in order to demonstrate some of the depth of Roy Scales collection before turning to um, the kind of more recent fine press books that are really the, the true highlight of the collection. So let's begin with Shakespeare, as no miniature book collection is complete without at least one set of Shakespeare's plays. The first set of Shakespeare's plays to be published in miniature appeared in 1880, and Shakespeare quickly became the most popular author in miniature books. 
The set pictured here, which we also have um, out here in person today, is my favorite set of Shakespeare miniatures, uh, the Knickerbocker Leather and Novelty Company Shakespeare set, which was printed between 1890 and 1930. And they are notable for their beautiful marbled end papers, which I um, have showing in this picture here. And as you can see, although in this set, all of the bindings are the same color, the end papers have more than one color, which is a really kind of nice highlight when you look through them. Fine literature and classics like Shakespeare and as well as novels were frequently published in miniature sizes in the early 20th century. And this allowed them to reach a wider audience and allowed people to read and to own important works of literature, which may otherwise have been inaccessible to them. And this isn't true about the Knickerbocker uh, leather company, but some companies that were producing very similar kinds of books at this time uh, they would go so far as to get classics into the hands of the masses as to distribute these books in cereal boxes and kind of other advertising stunts. So uh, although you could buy them in these lovely box sets, there were also sometimes other ways to access these kind of miniature classics. Next, I would like to share a dictionary from the collection. This is the Little Webster. And although it is quite tiny, it boasts 18,000 words bound in leather and featuring a snap closure, as you can see in this picture, um, that you can open that snap up, which protects the uh, red end papers. This book is an absolutely excellent condition for being nearly a century old. I've seen a similar uh, book from the same time period, a different bilingual dictionary, and it is not in the same kind of shape as this, which um, I think is especially interesting because uh, we see here the name E. Wallace and the year 1927 on the flyleaf in grade 11. Um, it seems to me that this was perhaps not used uh, so much um, as it perhaps could have been. Uh, and so although I cannot date this precisely because of that date, it was surely uh, printed sometime in the 1920s. Next, I would like to share something that is a bit of a mystery to me and I hope to find some time in the future to learn more about. I believe this is a Victorian tintype photo album, uh, likely from the late 1800s, perhaps as early as the 1860s. It's bound in leather and has gold page edges and a brass clasp, and each page includes a tintype photograph. Tintypes are photographs printed as negatives on sheets of tin, and most tintype photographs are studio portraits in the gem size. Um, as you can see here, that's what the photographs in this book are. And the gem size is around three quarters or one inch. Now from this little album itself, there's no information about who these people are, if they're relatives, how Royce acquired this, but because of that wealth of ephemera, um, perhaps if I dig hard enough, I can find that out and I would love to. Um, and although there are uh, quite a few miniature Victorian tintype photo albums from the 1860s and on, they're usually not this small. They usually have uh, two pictures on each, each page next to each other. Um, so this one is smaller than we even uh, normally find. All right, next I would like to share an 1897 flip book. Flip books are a clever combination of pictures intended to be flipped through providing an illusion of movement and animation without the use of a machine. The medium was very popular at the end of the 19th century when this flip book, A Story Without Words, was published in 1897. Depicting, as you can see, a boxing match, the, the flip book appears to be a recreation of the championship fight between Jim Corbett and Bob Fitzsimmons, which entered the public imagination as a documentary film, which was at the time the longest film released to date at over 100 minutes including all 14 three minute rounds. This flip book appears to depict the end of the fight. Perhaps it's the last round. It's a, it would take more research to determine that. Uh, but I would also like uh, to sh share with you this advertisement that I found for the book publishing company, which was published in the trade journal, The Phonoscope in the spring of 1897. So they advertised their flip books, including one called The Great Fight, which I think is this flip book. Um, as living photographs in which objects move and peoples act as if alive, promising new scenes weekly, including comedy, novelty, and as you can see, perhaps most titillating, the bedroom scene, which is not uh, in the collection. All right, so now I've kind of gone through some of my favorite historical books. Uh, and so as a way to kind of ease us into the fine press books that the collection excels in, I would like to begin by um, sharing this miniature telephone directory. 
And I selected this um, because there are two of these in the collection. And uh, what it is, is a telephone directory. It's, it's a little phone book, a miniature phone book of miniature collectors, creators um, that you could ask to be in. And at the end, there are advertisements. And as I said, there are two in the collection. And in the first one, Roy Scale is not included. And in the second one, he is. So I have this vision that he found this phone book and he thought I need to be included in this as you know an important collector here in Canada. And so uh, he is listed in it um, in that second one that, that he has. All right, so now to share something from one of the uh, presses that this collection is especially rich in. Robert E. Massman was the former director of library services at Central Connecticut University and published numerous miniatures at his REM press in New Britain, Connecticut. Um, and as I just told you, he was a uh, clearly a librarian of, of sorts himself, it does seem that a large number of miniature book creators and collectors were at some point librarians themselves. So perhaps that's part of why I'm so enthusiastic about miniatures. Massman is noted by miniature book collectors as having a stunning and imaginative aesthetic. I selected this book to share, which is the first of many bibliographies of REM miniatures produced by Massman and covers all the books that he published between 1962 and 1978. For uh, the fine presses, they would produce these bibliographies so that collectors who are very keen on the press, like Royce, would be able to tell if they had every single book that had been produced. Um, and then the bibliographies became collecting items themselves. This book was published in only 250 copies. And part of why I chose it is because of the interesting binding that you see here, the dos a dos binding, which is French for back to back. And it's a book structure in which two separate books are bound together so that each share a single board as a back cover. Uh, so you can read either of them depending on which direction and they both um, are the correct direction when you flip it. So they're kind of, um, I can't imagine how you actually make these. I can you know, barely handle it and figure out which direction it's supposed to be in. Uh, they also have really lovely um, artwork, uh, this bibliography. Another miniature uh, by the same press that I selected is um, this paper-bound book of drawings of historical landmarks in Boston, Lexington, and Concord. And part of why I selected this is because of the lovely fold-out map. And if you're paying attention, you might see that it took three hands to hold this open and another one to take a picture. So that's my hands and Jacqueline's hands uh, in this picture. Uh, Massman printed several versions of this, um, of this book by E. Helene Sherman in the mid-1970s which was notably at the time of the US Bicentennial, which is, I suspect, why these books were created. And this paper-bound version was printed in a run of 5,000 copies. There are also hardbound uh, versions produced in smaller runs that are also in the collection. And part of why I selected this book is because it was not actually on the shelf, but for a number of Royce's shelves, when you turn them around, there's a few things kind of tucked in the back. And so to me, this is a treasure um, kind of hiding in the back. And I think that perhaps this was there because he preferred the hardbound version to the paper version, but he of course needed to collect the paper mm -hmm. version as well. Okay. Uh, this copy of The Whole Art of Detection by Sherlock Holmes was published in 1968 by Black Cat Press, another very important uh, fine press that was run by the late Norman W. Forg in Skokie, Illinois, and with whom Royce seems to have developed a particular friendship. This book is bound in gilt leather with a three-dimensional silhouette of the famed detective with his well-beloved hats and pipe adorning the cover. So it's very clear what this is, even without um, the title on the front. The Black Cat Press is a bit interesting because it printed both full-size and miniature books, but it's considered as one of the Renaissance miniature book publishers of the US in the early 60s, leading to a renewed interest in the genre that had kind of fallen off after that first quarter century um, height. Okay, another example of a rare fine press work that really kind of tickled my fancy, I would say. Printed in only 35 copies, two of which are known to be held in major miniature book collections at academic libraries in the States. This book discusses composer and songwriter Cole Porter's love of fudge. So a very specific uh, topic. Uh, and not just fudge in general, but a particular kind of fudge. So good fudge made in his hometown of Peru, Indiana at Lewis Arnold's Candy Kitchen. This chocolate fudge was topped with pecans and uh, Porter ordered 12 pounds every month. 
Uh, this book is <laughs> beyond the subject matter. It is quirky and charming. It includes a US postage stamp featuring Porter. A number of miniature books include stamps inside of them. Um, it's uh, something that we see in, in quite a few miniatures. Uh, it also includes a recipe for fudge, an empty musical score if you feel so inclined as to write your own miniature music, and a fold-out page with a warning that eating fudge may produce ringing in the ears or induce miniature melodies or tunes in the head. Uh, I first um, kind of pulled this book off the shelf because of the pianos on the cover and it just kind of got more and more interesting. Next, I would like to share uh, this set of ultra micro miniatures, um, which I've given the German title of how they were sold. They were sold um, as the smallest books in the world by the Gutenberg uh, Museum. Uh, they were originally sold as a way for the museum to raise money after the war to rebuild. Uh, they were first printed in 1952, reprinted in the 60s, and then they, uh, the museum kind of occasionally reprints them, and you can actually buy a few of these from the museum today. So they've kind of, they must have printed more of them uh, recently. So all these books measure at less than five millimeters. The original book of the set is The Lord's Prayer, which contains the Lord's Prayer in six languages, although some um, people say that it's in seven languages because they count English and American English as two different languages, but I would call it six languages. Uh, all of the books do include multiple languages, including those that use a different alphabet, uh, such as Russian, Chinese, and Arabic, making the printing kind of an even more interesting feat, especially at this size. The books are hand bound in leather, decorated with gold blocking and stored in tiny transparent plexiglass cases that double as very strong magnifying glasses. And so with the magnifying glass, you can actually read the text on the page, which is not required for this one that I'm showing right here, where you can uh, quite clearly, hopefully, read Je t'aime, I love you, in French. That one you don't need a magnifying glass to read. Uh, so in the silk lined case uh, that Royce bought these and stored them in, the books are The Olympic Oath, The Lord's Prayer, The Liberty Bell, and then finally, I Love You, uh, the one that I'm showing kind of up close there. Now to show you kind of something entirely different that is still an ultra micro miniature, uh, there are these ch uh, charming tiny titles mini books, which were distributed in gumball machines in the 1960s and 70s. This includes a series of miniature comic books printed by Marvel in 1966 that have been certified by the Guinness Book of World Records as the smallest comic books uh, ever printed, and they were available exclusively from 10 cent toy gumball machines in the US. The six Marvel titles included characters um, popular at the time, some of whom are still popular today. Uh, including The Incredible Hulk, The Mighty Thor, Captain America, The Amazing Spider-Man, Sergeant Nick Fury, and Millie the Model. And I must confess, I do not know who Millie the Model is. <laughs> uh, each volume uses narration and black and white arts to tell the character's origin story. And unsurprisingly, perhaps, these tiny titles are highly sought after today, not only by collectors of miniature books, but of course by Marvel comic enthusiasts as well. Another uh, really interesting set in Royce's collection is this set, um, the Jewel Book Library, uh, that were printed uh, here in Montreal. All 16 of the Jewel Books are represented here, including a couple of uh, duplicates. And um, these, uh, they were actually stored by Royce in a wooden, I assume, jewelry case uh, that we see over there uh, with the top two drawers labeled gold and silver. Uh, they were all, they're also stored in their original um, plastic cases issued by the publisher that underneath give the more information about what the book is without actually needing to open it. Titles in here include the publisher's own The Secrets of a Miniature Book Publisher, Barbara D'Artois's How to Write to Miniature Books, and titles on several historical figures, including Confucius, Lucrezia Borgia, Johann Sebastian Bach, Elvis Presley, and Lady Di. So there's really quite a, quite a range represented in these books. Each volume is 26 by 23 millimeters, bound in gold or silver leatherettes with a faux jewel mounted on the cover. And they are all published as one of 300 copies in 1990. This is perhaps my favorite in the category of artist books. 
of which Royce Gale collected many. Created by artist Carol Schwartzot of Niagara Falls, New York, who was well known amongst miniature book collectors for using hand colored illustrations and accordion formats in her works. This book that I think is just beautiful is one of a set of four depicting uh, all four seasons. This is April rain and depicts of course spring. And when Jacqueline and I were first looking at these books together and taking these pictures and videos, um, it was the exact right time of when the daffodils were beginning to bloom here in Montreal, uh, which is why I could not help um, but include this in the set. Now I have one more book to share and I uh, want to kind of end on a little bit of a lighthearted note here. So every collection of miniature books tells us a great deal about the collector who carefully and painstakingly compiles it from the presses that they prefer to the genres in which they are most interested. Royce's collection demonstrates the deep connections he made with miniature book creators, publishers, and collectors across North America. We see a keen interest in North American history, as well as a keen eye for beautifully bound small press volumes. Additionally, I suspect, and you'll have to tell me if I'm wrong, uh, that Royce had another hobby playing golf. He has an entire wooden box full of miniature books, all pertaining to golf. And very unusually for Royce, this includes a number of mass market miniatures. So not ones that you would buy from a small press, but rather that you might be able to find at you know, the checkout of a big bookstore. Uh, and elsewhere in the collection, we see a tie pin shaped as a golf club. So I've selected one special volume from this box, uh, Olin Wound's 1966 printing of What I Know About Golf. Printed privately in 200 copies by Raymond A. Smith under his press name, DeRay Press. This volume consists of tan paper covers and 10 leaves containing presumably what the author knows about golf, which is absolutely nothing. Uh, perhaps even more clever than a good walk spoiled is this idea that even a seasoned golfer really knows nothing about golf. Uh, so I just wanted to select that one because I, I think that it uh, might tell us even more about the collector. Uh, and that is all that I have to share um, about uh, the miniature books that we selected today. There are over a thousand in this collection and anyone who looks at them and, and studies them or even browses them would pick something different, which is part of what's so marvelous about uh, collections of miniature books. Um, and so that is all that I have. There's supposed to be one more slide, I guess not. Um, and I will hand it back over to Jacqueline. An enormous thank you, Kristen, for such a great tour through this collection. And I, it wasn't my first time seeing it. I don't know if you could recognize my fingers, but they were on screen. You can tell from the not so nice cuticles. Those, the nice ones were Kristen's. Um, so we do welcome questions. If anyone tuning in on the live stream has questions about this collection or about the miniatures, you can send them in and we will voice them on your behalf for, to Kristen. Um, in while we wait for that to come in. So do send them in either through the chat or by email. Um, I think I may have to ask some of my own if you're willing to come back up. And also if anyone in the, in the gallery has comments or questions here, please feel free to voice them yourselves. But I will kick it off and I have to say, um, I noticed a slip up in that you said in America. Um, and and yes. I have to say that Kristen is originally from the United States yes, um, and we have claimed her for Canada for the moment, for the time being. Um, but it's interesting in your, in your experience, which is quite fast right now, <laughs> having just examined this collection of the Jewish Public Library, um, as well as this one here, what do you think are some of the key points of comparison between Lily Toth as a collector and Royce Gale? Did you see anything that, would, that was present in both collections? Yeah, that, that's a wonderful collect, um, question. Uh, so there are two books that I found in both collections, only two. I figured they're, they're both um, about the same size of collections, and so I figured there must be more crossover. There are two books that are the same. Uh, there is uh, one of the Carol Schwartzot books. Um, so this was April Rain, the autumn book they both share. Um, and something else that's interesting is that in Lily Toth's collection, we see the receipt for that book, 
uh, which is very unusual for Lily. Unlike Royce, she didn't keep any of that kind of information. And then I was also able to easily find the, the receipt for Royce. And so that was something interesting for me, knowing both collections. The other book that's the same, that's a bit more interesting, I'd say, is a very small, of course, um, book of Hungarian children's art. So uh, a museum in Budapest in the 70s um, asked children to produce art to go with the poetry of the Hungarian national poets. And so they received these drawings, they uh, curated a collection, and then they created an exhibit catalog in a regular size. Then they used photographic reduction to create the miniature version, um, which I find very charming because if you've ever handled an exhibit catalog, they're, they're very large and definitely not made for children to be able to handle. And so I love that they made a miniature version because the children who created the arts would be able to hold that themselves. And something interesting is that uh, Royce's bird copy of this had the dust jacket and is in mint condition, whereas uh, Lily's copy seem is much more worn and looks like somebody may actually have looked at it, looked at the artwork. Hungarian books were extremely prized by collectors in um, the, the mid 20th century. Hungary was considered one of the best producers of miniature books at the time, very high quality. So I think that that explains why Royce was interested in this book because the very high quality of Hungarian books, but he didn't have it on one of his shelves. It was in kind of amongst some of the extra kind of books for him. So it wasn't one of his most prized books. Whereas for Lily, it seems like this was a very prized book. And so we do see this really interesting crossover of this very unique book um, but we see that they were handled or thought of differently by the collectors, uh, which, which speaks about um, the different interests of the collectors, which, which I think is interesting. Can I ask a question? Yes. So I have a fabulous book that Donna actually points out. To yes. Me. This is the lollipop book. Yeah, I was going to ask a question, but I want to just read what captured my attention. Is there a camera? Yes, right there. So you can see what a lollipop book looks like. And the center page says to the to my biographers, multitudinous diaries to be read between the lines with studious reference to subliminal marginalia. To the four winds, my ashes, may they pollinate human dust with specks of genius. And it's a lovely little book with a lollipop. It says to be devoured but not eaten. Do you have any comments on this? Donna is the one who actually knows more about this this book than I do. I, I would say this. <laughs> I just it's I mean it's very unique. Uh, this is the only book like this that I have seen. It's um it's a really interesting use of the accordion format. So if you envision that you take a take a, like a long strip and then fold it over and over again and then uh, you. I guess glue the ends together, but all together. So it makes this kind of star shape. I mean, it's very unusual and clever um, and uh, is definitely one that's interesting to think about how do you actually keep this on the shelf? Um, <laughs> uh, and it's kind of tucked away in the upper corner of that one. Um, but uh, now I don't think that you said that the other interesting thing about this book is that it says for Roy scale. So we can see that, that deep connection uh, that Royce had. Thank you very much. Yes. It's also lovely. It's so delicate and precious that it would be terrifying to actually open the pages and try and read yes <laughs> the page. yes a number of of the books especially in Royce's collection are like that so you, it's uh they're very delicate so I will walk back on camera as the mouthpiece of one of these uh, one of the viewers on YouTube sent this in um that you had mentioned the fact that this collection spans a, a fairly broad swath of history. Um, I'm curious if you can speak a little bit more about the variety of binding structures that you encountered. And Kristen is off camera at the moment, but just made a great face. <laughs> so. uh, that's a great question. I am not an expert in binding. Um, so I think that I, I can kind of quickly say that we see a lot of what I would consider normal binding uh, for a book. Um, and I don't know all of the words as distinctly. And um, as I shared those images from the hobbyist book binder, he gave me some like very detailed comments about his bindings that I now wish that I uh, would be able to reproduce right now without referring to my notes. But we see books that are bound kind of more typically. Then we see uh, a few of that dosa dos that I, that I showed that is the really interesting double book structure. We also have a number um, that are just kind of paper bindings sewn together. I, 
maybe stapled together. I'm not sure if I saw any staples in this collection. You're, Jacqueline's nodding, so some stapled together. And then we see some of these kind of more really unusual ones, like the lollipop book, or there's one over there that looks like a ship, and I don't even know what makes it a book because I haven't been brave enough to kind of open it up. So we do see um, a variety of different types of binding or styles or, or creation of books, um, but that is not something that I am uh, particularly well versed in. I'm sorry. <laughs> So one other question from YouTube as I as I bring the virtual conversation into the room, and this this uh, viewer actually has the 1914 New Testament, which you mentioned that there's some religious books in the Roy Scale collection, um, and maybe you could speak a little bit to some of those titles. But this particular person has one that was inscribed to a, a soldier in 1915. But the question mm -hmm. is. What is it? It can it be categorized as a miniature because this one is three point seven five inches by two point five inches. So maybe you can speak to that. Uh, so that would depend on where you are located geographically. Um, the three inch definition is very strictly enforced by the miniature books. I mean, of course, you can consider a miniature whatever you would like to. Um, to count according to the Miniature Book Society, which is the definition used, especially in the United States and kind of more generally in America, is the three inches. However, other countries around the world use the four inch, um, which uh, here we use, we call macro miniatures, but in a number of other places, they use the four inch uh, as the size. So, for example, the museum I mentioned in Azerbaijan, they use the four inch kind of scale as the size. So if you're located somewhere else in the world or would like to call it a miniature yourself, then I think that if it would count, I would call it a miniature, a macro miniature specifically. But so it depends a little bit on geography. That's really lovely though, uh, for a, at a soldier at that time. So you can think, you know, exactly that, that that's, a, that's a World War I era book. And so you can imagine why a soldier would want to have that book while going to war, how the soldier would use it, if it was given as a gift to a soldier, um, what the person would be thinking when they gave it. It gives you a really nice kind of insight into why the miniature size would be so useful at that particular time. I'll follow up with a question about images in these miniature books. I noted a couple that you showed on screen. One was that tintype album and one was the postage stamp book. Both of those I saw in person when we were photographing them and caught my attention as well. So I'm glad you included them and spoke a little bit more to them. But maybe you could talk a little bit more about the alternative kinds of images that were, were used in the production of these because we saw some that were printed obviously from engraved plates, some that were actual postage stamps and some that were tin types. So maybe talk about images? Yeah, so everything, any way that you can produce an image in a book, we see in the miniature size. So we see things that are printed by woodcut, by engraving. We see things that, that are hand drawn in or merely hand colored engravings. We see a large number of postage stamps um, uh, glued in, that's that's fairly common, I think, because of the size and perhaps there's some crossover between stamp collectors and miniature book collectors. Um, we also see some really creative things going on with images. So like the Carol Schwartzoff book that you saw that has the um, kind of window into the next page that allows an image to kind of span more than one part of a book that I think is really clever. Um, but we really do just see absolutely Every, everything that you can imagine uh, in, in a book of any size, uh, we see in the miniature size. Um, I think that engravings are not quite as common because it's very difficult to engrave in the small size. But again, one of the challenges or interests of miniature books is doing something at such a small size demonstrates how skilled you are at the craft. And so if you were an engraver or an artist, it demonstrates how good you are to be able to do it at the smallest size. Um, I'm a knitter, and I can say that if you can knit at the smallest gauge without making mistakes and making something, you know, very particular and beautiful, you know, using size triple zero needles, like, does show something uh, compared to knitting with the largest size of needles. So that, like, extra demonstration of skill. Yeah, Chris. Amongst the golfing books, were any of the books about miniature golf? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, Chris just asked if amongst the golf books, if any of the books were about miniature golf, and, and no, and I really missed the, uh, the opportunity to make a good pun there. Uh, one of them uh, is a scorecard, and that was actually the first one that I wanted to photograph was a, a scorecard, um, 
And then Jacqueline was like, I'm not sure if that's like the most interesting thing that you could photograph, like a partially filled in scorecard. It just uh, it kind of had this nice historic look that I really liked. Um, but no, no miniature golf books. Something missing from the collection for sure. <laughs> One more question from online and then we'll take yours, if that's all right. This comes in um, by email from Ken Simpson, and he wanted to know if you could comment on the role of paper quality in these miniature books. And we're throwing some tough ones, Kristen's <laughs> direction. I know that there are some people, local paper producers even, who, whose work at perhaps saint Elmont, the Papeterie down there, their, their paper would make astonishingly lovely miniature books. But Kristen, did you notice any things of note in the, in the collection that you that you came across. Yeah, we're asking really specific uh, book questions that makes me feel like I really need to brush up on some of my um, like history of the book uh, uh, coursework before I, I talk about these things next. Um, so because most of the books in this collection are fine art books, we have very high quality, lovely paper. Uh, some of the more historical ones, we see some less high quality paper, um, much thinner paper. We often see that in miniatures in religious books, especially because so many were produced um, and you know, if you have a miniature Bible, for example, you have it so that you can carry those words around with you, but you likely have a regular size Bible that you can refer to for the majority of your reading because it'd be more comfortable for your hands and for your eyesight. Um, but so those we often see kind of the, the less high quality paper. Sometimes um, the thinnest of paper, I think it's sometimes this onion skin paper. Okay, onion skin paper, excellent. I just checked with Jacqueline. Um, we see some onion skin paper in books that are trying to fit even more pages in a small space. So something like the dictionary that I showed is going to be kind of like a lower quality paper because they're trying to fit as many words as possible into the smallest possible package. And um, so it depends on what the book is, is kind of being used for. If you want it to be an absolutely beautiful work of art, highest quality paper possible. If you're trying to fit as many words or as many things into the smallest package, then you're going to go um, have lower quality paper and thinner paper. Yes, definitely. So Donna's asking about some of the books in slipcases. There's a variety of slipcases uh, that we see in here. A lot of the fine artist books are in slipcases. Um, the, again, the Dosa Do that I showed uh, is in a slipcase, a bright orange slipcase. Jacqueline's uh, bringing out one of them similar to it now. Um, the slipcases, uh, in my estimation, are primarily to protect, um, especially, and I think that that's especially important for the fine press books that are produced in such low numbers and are such valuable for collectors. So Jacqueline just brought over. So I have the Dosa Dos here. So it comes in this orange slipcase. And as many of, of Royce's things do, it comes with an extra little booklet uh, that gives information about, uh, it's, it's extra it's supplemental information. But Royce also has, as I can now show you, uh, this letter in 1978 saying, thank you for buying this book. Um, and so he kept that as well as the, I guess like addendum that was printed by the publisher inside the slipcase. And then we see the actual book here in the Dosa Dos, you can see um, that it goes in both directions. Uh, but so the slipcase, you know, for a collector like Royce who keeps these extra things allows everything to be kept together in one package. Uh, but um, when you put the slipcase on, it's going to protect uh, the page edges. And so we see that we can get a look. It's harder for the Dosa Do to show that because we have like more page edges than is typical for a book, but it allows the book to be um, protected even further when putting it on the shelf, which reminds me of the practice in uh, medieval Europe of you didn't uh, shelve a book with the spine facing out, but you shelved a book with the spine facing in because you wanted to protect the book from, from going up against the edge. So it's like another way of protecting. There are other, other kind of interesting things that might count as slip cases, like the, you know, does the box count? It kind of does the same kind of work as a slip case or the teeny tiny ones that are coming um, in the magnifying case or even the, the Marvel ones that I showed that Royce kept in this like kind of long skinny box to keep them all together, but it didn't have a top. So, <laughs> um, but I haven't studied slipcases uh, uh, very, very closely. And um, I did note that uh, I think that a number of the fine presses had a particular color that they liked to use either for all their books or maybe for particular years. That would be something that a researcher maybe could look into and I think would be really interesting. There's a very timely comment that just came in on YouTube about 
a case. And what I noted as well in the collection is that there are some very creative cases, some that look like small buildings or barns and you open the doors and there's a book inside. And Claudia commented that she had a very much loved miniature set as a child from Murray Sales. It was fairy tales. And it came in a double box that was designed to look like a bookshop. And you open the doors and inside you had the actual books. And on that note, I'm going to stop the question there and open the floor for thank yous. And I will say an enormous one to Kristen. We can give her a round of applause. And <laughs> and get to drink the water off camera. Thank you so much, Kristen, for such an interesting talk. And to Chris and Natalie as well for introducing the collection. Thank you to all of you who are here in person. You've probably seen my name on emails and now I see it, you see me in person. Um, thank you for coming out and joining us in person. We hope to see you at some of our events over the summer and next fall as well. To those of you joining us online, thank you for tuning in and we will send a follow-up with links and more photos of some of these tiny books so you can look at them up close. The collection is a research collection so you can book a visit and come and examine some of these volumes for yourself. If you're interested in the slip cases, Chris is nodding. Do you wanna add something to that? You're welcome to come up for some closing notes. It's a, an important thing to underscore. And I think in the spirit of Roy Scale, and his family and the idea of generosity and, and making these things not only um, preserved, but accessible. This is true of all our collections. We're a research institution, but we're also a public institution. So uh, I always like to say we're the antithesis of Fort Knox in that we don't want to keep you away from our, our gold. We want you to come and enjoy our gold. So we're open to everyone with every sort of research interest or just interest and curiosity to come and consult our material. And should we say good night at this yeah. point or good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are and uh, do check out our events for the summer. We do have a robust program and we will during the upcoming academic year and if all goes well, we'll have more hybrid events so we can see you in person. Thank you. Good night. Good night.